Mark chapter 6. Well, we're right in the middle of this chapter on this Father's Day. And it's interesting. The, these titles in your chapters, if you have a print Bible or maybe even a, a digital version, often they'll put headers in the chapter that are not necessarily inspired. The, the original authors didn't put them there. They didn't put chapter and verse in the Bible. Those were added later. But it's interesting. If you look at the headings, that how some have kind of organized this chapter, chapter 6, it, it kind of ebbs and flows. This is what I mean by that. As you open up chapter 6, you'll notice that the title, or at least the section, is about Jesus being rejected. It kind of starts at a low point. Now, this isn't new as we've been going through the Gospel of Mark. Jesus is often rejected, but most often by the religious elite or religious leaders. But the chapter kind of starts there, and then it kind of peaks a little bit. You maybe learned this last week if you were in person or online with us, where Jesus sends out his disciples, and they seem to have the same kind of authority and a very similar dynamic to their ministry as Jesus does. I mean, Mark 6 tells us that they cast out demons, that they heal diseases in Jesus' name. See, the chapter kind of starts here. Jesus is rejected in his hometown. He sends out his disciples, and things are just firing. I mean, to be connected to Jesus, it's a good day. When you're sent out by him, you, you walk out in that same kind of authority and presence and power that he does. They're casting out demons. They're healing those who are diseased and sick. And then the chapter title, you know, for where we are today, it says, The Death of John the Baptist. Kind of go here, you're up here, and then you're down here. But then if you look at the remainder of the chapter, you see that it says that Jesus feeds 5,000. Now, maybe you know this if you grew up in church, or, or maybe you don't, but what that means contextually is that he fed 5,000 men and the women and children who are present. Way more than can fulfill the, the Pensacola Bay Center, right? It's just 5,000 men. There's probably 20,000 people there that Jesus miraculously feeds, and then the chapter ends with him walking on water. Anyone heard these stories before? You went to Sunday school. Okay, these are not unfamiliar to you, right? Well, here's what I find interesting. The way that this chapter kind of ebbs and flows like this, there's rejection, there's authority and power for his boys, there's the death of John the Baptist, but he's feeding 5,000, he's, he's walking on water. It ebbs and it flows. And I think the way that this chapter is set up its point has a tremendous point for us as we just consider this morning verses 14 through 29 as we're considering the death of John the Baptist. I think you know this by now if you've been walking through this book with us for any length of time. It seems like the overarching point of what Mark presents through this gospel is who Jesus is and what he taught. And who Jesus is, he's the king He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. That's chapter 1, verse 1. Mark doesn't pull any punches. He moves very quickly through the life and actions of Jesus to prove something. The Mashiach has arrived. The Christos, the anointed one, the Messiah. He's here. Jesus. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. And he's preaching a message everywhere he goes that the kingdom of God is now. It's arrived. And to put that into the context of those who would have been listening to Jesus speaks, this is, this is awesome. This is riveting. This is emotionally charged. This is something that the people of God have been waiting for for centuries, promised by the prophets that there would come a Messiah who would lead, promised that there would come a time where God's presence would be very real and powerful and present with his people, and they would be victorious. This is what Mark is teaching. This is what Mark is sharing. This is what Mark is showing. And we're at a point, specifically in this book, but also in the life and ministry of Jesus, where the fame of his name is growing and spreading like a wildfire. His name is being heard of, known almost everywhere in the area. And that's where we pick up in God's word this morning. 
it says in verse 14 that the message of who Jesus is has kind of moved from the streets of the villages into, well, look at what it says in verse 14. Herod Antipas, the king, soon heard about Jesus because everyone was talking about him. Do you get the sense of the context? This is a high point. Yeah, he was rejected, but he's sending out his disciples and they're casting out demons and healing those that are diseased. Everyone is talking about, everyone is hearing about Jesus. And it says there in verse 14, so much so that the king, the king hears about him. But I would ask, this, what, a king? Aren't they under the authority of the Roman Empire? Who is this king? Well, Herod is not a, a person's first name. It's a family name. And there was a dynasty of kings that went by the Herodian dynasty for about 140 years. And their rule, their reign, so to speak, was extremely immoral. It's kind of characterized by violence, betrayal, deceit, immorality, gluttony. It was a wicked leadership. And Herod the Great, he was in authority when Jesus was born. He's that Herod that killed all the young Jewish boys age two and under. Well, he had 10 wives, including one of his nieces as one of those brides, three sons, and he actually had six different wills when he died. And each had a different succession plan for his three sons. So obviously, when you got that kind of dynamic, there's a power struggle that ensued. And Rome came in, solved that struggle by kind of breaking up the areas of authority that this Herod the Great had and gave them to his sons. Now, the area of Galilee, where Jesus spent a lot of his time, a lot of his ministry, was given over to this guy in verse 14, Herod Antipas. That's who this guy is. But here's the deal. He was never actually a king. We'll, we'll get more insight into kind of the dynamics of his rule and reign. But remember, Mark is writing this years after these events. And Mark has this knack of writing where he uses a lot of irony. He, he's kind of poking at this idea that this guy Antipas could ever be considered a king by calling him a king. There was nothing royal. Nothing worthy of respect. No, no kingly dynamic about this guy. In fact, his life ends in shame. And this guy, Herod Antipas, he wanted to be king. And his wife, Herodias, doesn't that get confusing? You're like, <laughs> Herod, Herodias, okay, Herodias, she was all about it. She's constantly goading him throughout what we can tell from history to go for greater glory, to grab that title as king. And we'll read more about his wife today. She's kind of like the Jezebel of the New Testament. But history tells us that Rome grew so irritated with this guy's hunger and thirst for power that eventually he was banished. And, and the, the area that he did rule over was given to one of his nephews. But the news of Jesus, it's growing, it's kind of swelling. And this kind of wannabe, wicked, kind of somewhat henpecked king, who's not really a king at all, hears about Jesus. Well, what is he hearing? Look again at verse 14. It says, some were saying, this must be John the Baptist raised from the dead. That's why he can do such great miracles. Now, here's what's interesting about this. John the Baptist raised from the dead? I mean, to me, as I first read, that sounds a little like superstitious, maybe even a little bit kooky, but also it's weird. Like John the Baptist, he never performed any miracles. He's known for an awesome wardrobe, right? That's John the Baptist. Camel here, locust. He's there as this powerhouse prophet preaching repentance. He's the one who's the forerunner of Jesus. He's the one who baptized. That's who, that's who John is. But we'll get back to this at the end of our time together. But have you ever noticed that people have wacky views of who Jesus is? That's not new. That's happening right. Oh, he's John the Baptist raised from the dead. What? 
That's not even who John the Baptist, oh, okay. Well, verse 15, it says that others are saying, no, he's Elijah. Still others were saying he's a prophet, just like the other great prophets of the past. Now, I'm just telling you what I, I mean, I could see why some people would say he's like another prophet. Prophets of the past had powerful messages, and often they would perform miraculous. God would do these things as like proof positive of their message and to validate their position as a messenger from God. And most certainly, John the Baptist was teaching and preaching powerfully. He's Elijah. What is that about? Elijah, another powerhouse prophet of the Old Testament. And 2 Kings tells us that he actually never died, but was translated into heaven by a chariot of fire. And a prophecy in the book of Malachi regarding Elijah talks about his, his ministry coming again. And Jesus explained to his disciples that John in some way had fulfilled that in the type of ministry that he had. But when Herod heard these rumors, these rumblings about Jesus, Remember, set yourself in the context of what's happening. His disciples are going out. They're preaching, they're teaching, they're healing, they're doing miracles. His fame is spreading everywhere. This guy, Herod Antipas, who Mark calls the king, kind of poking at him, he hears about this. And what is his opinion? Look at verse 16. When Herod, when he heard about Jesus, he said, John, the man I beheaded, has come back from the dead. Herod's riddled with guilt. It's kind of like, I don't know, maybe you could put it in this kind of description, like a Ebenezer kind of Jacob Marley moment, right? Like he's kind of haunted by his past, thinking that he's come back to haunt me, the one whom I've executed. And for our time in God's word together, on this morning, on Father's Day, here's what we're doing. We're kind of in a moment where Mark does a flashback. He takes time to explain what happened to John the Baptist. And as I said earlier, we're kind of at a low point in this chapter, in Mark's gospel, in the middle of Mark chapter 6. But this low point has a tremendous point for us as we walk with Jesus. So hang with me this morning. We're going to walk through this flashback, this, this kind of recounting that Mark gives us of what happens to John the Baptist. And for sure, it's kind of this low point, but it has a tremendous point for you and I who seek to walk with Jesus. So let's step into the past of this. Let's look at verse 17 as Mark describes what happens. He said, Herod had sent soldiers to arrest and imprison John. Why did he do this? As a favor to Herodias. So, okay, we know who Herodias is. That's, that's Herod Antipas' wife, the one who just eventually goaded him so much for greater glory that to be given that title of king that he's banished. Well, why does John have her arrested as a favor for her? Why would she care? Verse 17. She had been his brother Philip's wife, but Herod had married her. It's not as though Philip died and, and his brother did a noble thing by marrying her. No, this is kind of bizarre. Herodias was actually the half-niece to her first husband, Philip, and now her current husband, Antipas. So in her first marriage, she married her half-uncle, divorced him, married another half-uncle, Antipas, and Antipas then divorced his first wife to make this all happen. This is weird, don't you think? Herodias... As his second wife, this king commits adultery and a, and a type of incest. Why is this wicked woman so upset? Look at verse 18. John had been telling Herod, it's against the law, God's law, for you to marry your brother's wife. Remember, this Herod was partly Jewish. And the context seems to indicate that John, both publicly and privately, is saying, listen, what you're doing is wrong. So as verse 19 says, Herodias bore a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. 
Now, the way that Mark describes this, especially to those who would have first been reading it, it's this concept that she's not just mad at him, didn't just have a case of the Mondays when it came to, to John the Baptist, but she wouldn't let up. She was waiting for an opportunity to see John killed. And in verse 19, it goes on to say, but without Herod's approval, she's powerless. For Herod respected John. And knowing that he was a good and holy man, he protected him. And Herod was greatly disturbed whenever he talked with John. But even so, he liked to listen to him. See, Herod could tell there's something about this guy, John. There's a sense of holiness to him and goodness to what he's doing. His lifestyle and his, and his words seem to be blessed of God. So... It's like he's appeasing his, his half-niece of a wife by imprisoning John. The challenge with Herod is that he doesn't follow through with what he knows to be right. It's like he attempts to keep God somewhat in a corner in his life. He's disturbed. He's guilty, senses that John is right. He even has this sense of like, I, I kind of almost enjoy listening to him, but there's no change. He wanted to keep God at arm's length without change. But that kind of approach, well, look at what happens. Verse 21, Herodias's chance finally came on Herod's birthday. He gave a party for his high government officials and army officers and the leading citizens of Galilee. Herodias is kind of on tiptoe waiting for her moment to strike against this one who's causing her image and reputation to be tarnished. And it seems like her day finally arrives. It's Herod's birthday. So he throws a party for himself. And just a little bit of insight into the kind of man that Herod was. The Jews at this time viewed parties for oneself on a birthday to be something that the pagans did. They would never do that. But Herod, he does not care. Right? It's not a time just for him to celebrate, though it probably was to a certain degree, but the party had an agenda. Remember, he wants to be known as king. So what does he do? Invites all the important people, notable men from government, military, and civil strata in Galilee. Hopes to kind of entertain them, impress them, win their respect, admiration by this elaborate party. And culture and history tells us that these kind of parties were extravagant kind of meant to be a way to kind of project who you were and how you're doing. Like a high school reunion. How you do? Oh, yeah, we're doing good. See what I'm doing? Like that kind of thing. It's, a, it's an image thing. To display wealth and then to provide an opportunity to satisfy pleasure. So Herodias sees her moment. Th this is the time where her insecure husband who wants to impress all those wealthy and important people around him, she sees this as the moment to strike. She knows that Herod and these men will kind of be led into a drunken stupor, and she's going to play to those vices. And she uses the innocence of her daughter to get what she wants. Look at verse 22. It says, Then his daughter, very confusing, also named Herodias, came in and performed a dance that greatly pleased Herod and his guests. Now, some translations say his daughter. Other translations say her daughter. Most likely, this Herodias, who's also known historically as Salome, is the stepdaughter. She's from the first marriage that Herodias, her mom, had with Philip. The whole thing is a mess. And there's no need to kind of go into the dynamics of this dance. But I just want to say this. This wasn't a majorette performance, right? She didn't have her baton and a little hat. He's like, look at that. Can you see? What? This wasn't a gymnastics routine where he's like, look at that, a double gainer. If that's something, I don't know. But like, that's not the kind of dynamic that's happening in this party. It was a seductive dynamic that played to the vices of these weak men. And the king, so to speak, who has no kingly dignity at all, what does he say? How does he respond? Look at verse 22. Ask me anything you like, the king said to the girl, and I will give it to you. Then he even vowed. He vowed, I will give you whatever you ask up to half my kingdom. Does he have a kingdom to give? Not really. 
Herod and kind of this rabble of positioned men knew that he had no kingdom to give. His, his power came from Rome. But Herod here is being grandiose, right? Probably not even to be taken literally. People, oh, there's Herod kind of pontificating in. He's like a peacock, peacock, right? Like just kind of ruffling his feathers. But at this moment, this young girl understood that she could practically ask for anything. And so what does she do? She goes back to the one who sent her in there. Verse 24. She went out and asked her mother, what should I ask for? And her mother told her, ask for the head of John the Baptist. You know, Herod, by birth, is a Jew, at least half. In this culture, Jews would have never allowed a woman to dance before a group of men. He's such in a place of compromise in his life because what he's pursuing are all these external things. He could care less about his identity as a Jewish man. Gentiles, those that aren't Jewish, their mothers would have forbidden a daughter to do what this daughter of Herodias did. But Herodias cared more about silencing John than she did the dignity, the safety, the reputation of her own little girl. John was a nuisance to her conscience, cancer to her reputation. So in her mind, his head at the expense of her daughter's dignity, that would solve all her problems. This is what she thought. So what does Mark tell us? Verse 25, so the girl hurried back to the king and told him, I want the head of John the Baptist right now on a tray. Then the king deeply regretted what he had said because of the vows he had made in front of his guests, and he couldn't refuse her. He's trapped. His pride, his foolishness, his lust, his need to be recognized. He's definitely somber, but ultimately this man is spineless. He's made a vow. Irrevocable in that culture. And to break it would be a sign of weakness of who he is before these men that he so desperately is trying to impress. And out of regard for himself and his own reputation, he's stuck. He knows he can't refuse her request. So this is where our text ends this morning. Again, happy Father's Day, death of John the Baptist. So immediately... He sent an executioner to the prison to cut off John's head and bring it to him. The soldier beheaded John in the prison, brought his head on a tray, gave it to the girl, took it to her mother. And when John's disciples heard what had happened, they came to get his body and buried it in a tomb. Herod covers his own hide. John is executed. Head's given to the girl. The girl takes the head, gives it to her mother. John's disciples arrive to retrieve and bury the body. And this kingly couple, Herodias and Herod, she satisfies her, her bloodlust for revenge, so to speak. At least outwardly, to a certain degree, has kind of silenced her critics. Herod saved face in front of his guests. But he's also kind of been shown up by his wife, right? Shown his true colors. And he's left with fear and guilt over what he's done. That's why Mark records for us, as those disciples are going out, gracious, what they're doing, the fame of Jesus' name is spreading. Well, when Herod Antipas, this king who's not really a king, heard about Jesus, the guilt bubbles up, and he thinks this has got to be John coming back from the dead. Well, that's today's message. I hope you guys have a great Father's Day. <laughs> no. What do we do with this, right? Like, what is going on here? Remember with me, if you will, the goal of Mark's gospel. It's to jolt people into an understanding of who Jesus is. An understanding of who he is and what he preached. And you know who he is. He's the king. He's the Messiah. He's the son of God. 
He's preaching that the rule, the reign, the authority, the kingdom, the presence, the power of God has come at long last now. And the Gospels are not everything that happened to, for, and around and about Jesus in his earthly ministry. They're specifically selected events to prove something, to show something, to describe something, to unpack something about who Jesus is and to validate his message. So why? Why does Mark include this? Right in the middle of everything that's happening in this chapter as it kind of ebbs and flows at this point where Jesus is rejected and then the disciples are sent out. Right? That's left off in verse 13. And then in verse 30, we're back to the disciples. Oh, yeah, they come back to Jesus. But verse 14 through 29, we see this recount of John. And then we're back on a high point where Jesus is feeding the multitudes. He's walking on water. And today, we see this preacher, this prophet of righteousness, he gets his head lopped off and served up. The 12 disciples are being sent out with great authority and power, and Jesus' ministry is at a high point. Everyone's hearing about him, even Herod. But not everyone, if you will, please listen to this. Not everyone, please hear this. Not everything connected to Jesus is about authority, influence, conquering, being the head and not the tail, being too blessed to be stressed. Not everything connected with Jesus is connected on that level. See, the thing is, this low point has a tremendous point for those of us who walk with Jesus. See, we have the vantage point of almost 2,100 years later. We know that Jesus didn't come just to walk on water, just to feed the masses, to perform miracles, to provide healing for those who needed, to give insightful and radical teachings. In the mind of those who were in that moment, that's kind of what they see. This is who Jesus is. He's conquering everything. His disciples are going out. Man, to be connected to Jesus means you're in the kingdom. Authority, power, diseases are being dispelled. Demons are scattering. That's what it means to be connected to Jesus. But see, not everything about this king, this Messiah, the Son of God, who preached that the kingdom of God, his rule and his reign has come, is about winning on this side of eternity, but winning at the right things in light of eternity. The right things. Look at this comparison with me, if you will, for just a moment between John the Baptist and this guy, Herod. Like, these are some of the differences, right? Awesome wardrobe, right, J the B? Hair-coated prophet. Gorgeously robed ruler. Austere and simple, flamboyant, righteous and debaucherous. A prophet without price, a man who could be bought. What's the point of this? I mean, many of us in the way we perceive or take in or kind of identify success is by what we see outwardly. Not inwardly, but outwardly, Herod to a certain degree. Seems to get away with what he wants, and he's, man, he's the king. John the Baptist never has any kind of possessions and loses his head. But in the things that matter, being able to see things in light of eternity... John wins. So why has Mark kind of wedged this seemingly out-of-place story right here in this chapter of all places? Well, nerd out with me for a second, if you will. Let's look at this a little bit analytically. Consider with me the story of John's death may be Mark's way of beginning to foreshadow why Jesus has actually come. Look at the parallels between John the Baptist now and Jesus. Very interesting. Both innocent of any crime, but offended the civil rulers. Held in a civil prison before execution. Herodias manipulates Herod to strike at John. The chief priests manipulated Pilate to strike at Jesus. Herod didn't want to kill John, but he feared the consequences. Pilate didn't want to kill Jesus, but he feared the crowd. They were both executed by a civil power, and both their followers claimed the body and buried their leader. Interesting foreshadowing of what's to come. 
It's interesting, it's intriguing, but also consider this with me. Verse 13 to verse 30 of this chapter, it's about Jesus sending out his disciples. Everyone's hearing about him. It's amazing. And Mark's unusual placement of Herod's flashback of J the B alongside this account of who the apostles are and their victories, I think it puts in perspective and gives full perspective of what following Jesus actually looks like. But what do you mean by that? Again, I know we're nerding out. I know we're getting a little analytical. It's Father's Day. You guys are just thinking about what kind of steak, what temperature. I know that, but just hang with me. Look at the difference between like, now not John the Baptist and Jesus, but Antipas and the apostles. Antipas, ruling in decadent luxury. Apostles are sent out in poverty. Antipas lives a self-centered life. Apostles, they're meant to be selfless. Antipas, anyone in my way, knocking them down. Apostles are healing people. Antipas, can I, can I say it this way? An hour and five minutes of entertainment. Apostles, they're serving Jesus with their lives. Antipas, cowardly. Apostles, not always, they're human. But in this little epoch description, there's a sense of bravery. They're going out. Antipas, eventually he's banished. He doesn't end well. Apostles, in context of eternity, they have a good death. Their death had purpose. They're martyred for serving God. Mark's placement of these two stories, I hope you're, you can still hang with this, it approaches brilliance and the way in which he describes this. The disciples are winning and John is losing. And they're both following Jesus right where he wants them. The disciples show this tremendous reality. Please don't miss this. The blessing and the victory that can come in following Jesus. Absolutely. John's death reminds us of the cost of following Jesus. The important thing as a follower of Jesus is to win at the right things with the right perspective. Eternity. And it's like Mark gives us these options, right? Right? Option one shows a cowardly man who has wealth but no character. Option two shows these men who are sent out but have character but no wealth. Option one enjoys earthly power. Option two enjoys heavenly power, which may cost everything. And one author put it this way. Mark doesn't patronize us with any nonsense about Jesus making our lives easy. He shows us that following Jesus can be costly, but it's right. And it's almost like he's saying you can have option one or two, but not both choose now. And if you were to say, what's the point? Here's the point of what I'm trying to say. A takeaway from this passage is clear. Suffering and cost is part of the dynamic in following Jesus. Unlike Herod, let's keep our sights focused focused on winning at the right things in light of eternity. One of the right things on a Father's Day is to be some of those things that we saw in a video. Man, Dad shows up. Dad tells me that he loves me. Dad works hard for us. In light of eternity, dads, you are giving those kids a perspective, a reflection, an image, so to speak, of who their heavenly father is. And it's very daily. It's not flamboyant. It's like putting on coat's hair or whatever that camel hair was, right? It's not like this thing that's meant to be impressive. To win at the right things in light of eternity. That's what ultimately matters. That, that following Jesus can look exactly like what's going on with the disciples. And that's right where God had them. They're casting out demons. They're healing the diseased. Everyone is hearing about Jesus. And then there's John who loses his head and he's right where Jesus, right where God would have him. And there's this balance. I think I shared this a couple weeks ago that in life, it's ever so important to have this perspective that some things are problems to solve and some things are tensions to balance. 
And as a Christian, we walk in this balance, recognizing the cost of following Jesus and also the tremendous blessing. And there's this ebb and this flow. And how John positions this little recount of John the Baptist is perfectly placed in a brilliant platform to show us what following Jesus looks like. There's cost to it. There may be suffering. But, but can I say this? This isn't the end of the story. Pastor Joe mentioned this. We have a future. Maybe you know this about me. It's, it's because I need simplicity. I, I'm like an addicted alliterator. Now, if you're, what does that mean? It's not some kind of drug. Don't worry. It's just like Lily, Lucy, Layla, Liam, Leo, Le you know, all those kids. Also, as a believer, I'm forgiven. I'm free. I'm part of a family. And I have a future. And as a disciple of Jesus, that mindset then guides my way of interpreting life's events. Not everything is about winning on this side of eternity. Not everything about following Jesus will always be, you're the head and not the tail, blessed to be stressed. Yes, there's seasons. Yes, there may be, that may be true for some, but there's also this reality that for some following Jesus, it looks like suffering. It looks like cost. Do you know that in the first century, Christianity didn't invent baptism? Baptism was a very common method of converting from one religious thought to another. Many different groups were baptized. But when you were baptized in Jesus' name in the first century, you were saying, Caesar is not Lord, Jesus is. You were declaring, you were writing, you were signing your death sentence. That, that to be identified with Jesus, right out the gate, the first thing he tells me to do to be baptized, it costs. It costs. And that which costs me nothing is worth nothing to me. Following Jesus, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. There is this element of authority and blessing and power. Absolutely. Do, read chapter 6. But also hold this intention that there's cost, there's suffering. And the lesson to be learned is to win at the right things in light of eternity. Who cares about being called King Herod? Any Herods among us this morning, that first name? Any Johns or anyone know a John? I know a John. You ever heard? Yeah. That name lasts, right? This is just a simple illustration, but the point is, Win at things that matter. We've got just a couple more minutes, so I wanted to share one more thing, one more handle to grab a hold of, I would say, from this text. There's an angle here that I don't want you to miss, and I mentioned that we would come back to this, but how can all those wacky views of Jesus? Oh, it's John the Baptist raised. It's Elijah. It's a prophet. Let me share three things with you this morning that I think are important to gain from this text. It kind of shows us a little bit about the world we live in. In our day, just in that day, people want to cling to weird ideas about Jesus. Time fails us to consider some of the wackiest ideas of who Jesus is. You could just stream Hulu for two hours and you'll get an ad that somehow, you know, probably talks about that. But even this data that I'll put up on the screen that's actually just about maybe five to six years old, you know, it's interesting. Most people's idea about Jesus, at least in America, I don't know if you can read that from here, but it's very presentable, sanitary, and acceptable, and socially fitting. Say, so what do you mean by that? 93% of people believe that Jesus actually existed. Well, that's sanitary. That's safe to believe that. Yeah, he existed. <coughs> And most, as it says there in the top right, these big words, these are the things that they believe about him. He's accepting, brave, warm, strong. I love the little, like, smaller one, fun-loving. It's almost like a Talladega Nights, you know, my infant Jesus, my tuxedo shirt Jesus. If you know that reference, okay. If you don't, you're probably better for it. But, like, <laughs> that's the mindset, right? Like, this is who my Jesus is. And this, this is like six-year-old data, but... It's probably still somewhat true. Nine out of ten people, so to speak. They've got a very sanitary perspective of who Jesus is, but please listen to me. It's insane, and it's deceptive, because that's not who Jesus claims to be. 
Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Mark chapter 1, verse 1. This is the King. This is the Messiah. This is the Son of God. Like right out the gate. This is who He is. And in, and in this day and time, all these wacky views to explain who Jesus is, just let the truth of Jesus has it stay. The weirdest thing you could believe about Jesus is to believe something other than the truth of who he really is. People want to cling to weird ideas about Jesus. It's one thing we see from this text. A second thing, and this may be the reason why, people don't always want the truth. You have to realize that. Some would take it this far. I don't know if I would take it this far, but some would say that when you're sharing truth, you've only got a 25% chance of success rate. Say, so why do you say that? The four soils of the heart, some would say. Some are stony, some are rocky. Is it meant to be taken that literally? I don't know, but I do know this. I know that not everyone wants to hear the truth. What do you mean by that? John chapter 3, let me read it to you. God's light came into the world, but people love darkness more than light, for their actions are evil. There is this reality that we live in a world that doesn't necessarily want truth. 2 Corinthians 4, Paul tells this to the early church. Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They're unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand the message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. He would tell Timothy that we live in this time, specifically now, that you should know, Timothy, that in the last days, there will be very difficult times. People will only love themselves and their money. They'll be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They'll be unloving and unforgiving. They'll slander others, have no self-control. They'll be cruel and hate what is good. They'll betray friends. Be reckless, puffed up with pride, love pleasure rather than God. People have wacky views about Jesus. That's exactly what's going on in that chapter. John, preacher of righteousness and truth, Herodias and Herod, John may wanted to keep it at arm's length, but ultimately didn't want the truth to have it stay. And then third and finally, People are easily influenced by evil. 1 Corinthians 6, Paul writes this, Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves or greedy people or drunkards or abusive or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Some of you were once like that. But you were cleansed. You were made holy. You were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. The only thing that separates us is that we're good, wholesome, awesome church people. No. <laughs> Jesus is the only thing that... This is who we were. But through repentance and faith in Jesus, He's changing us. But human nature is easily influenced by evil. Many don't want the truth, and many hold to wacky views about who Jesus is. So what should we do? Let me give you three names to remember. Paul, Moses, and Jesus. Paul says this in Romans chapter 9. For my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters, I would be willing to be forever cursed and cut off from Christ if that would save them. Moses... In Exodus 32, his heart, speaking to God, but now if you will only forgive their sin, but if not, erase my name from your record that you have written. The heart of Jesus, Galatians 3, Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. For when he hung on a cross, he took upon the curse for our wrongdoing. For it is written in the scriptures, cursed is everyone who hung on a tree. Let's go after people in truth and in grace and in love. 
Somebody put it this way, and again, it helps me remember. Our role is to let the truth loose and to pray. Because people are resistant, may God's people be persistent in their love and truth. And I really do believe that in the 21st century, evangelism looks much like relationships and a little bit of time. There's a wealth, a plethora, an overload of information in the culture that we live in. And many in that Gen Z, Millennial X, Boomer, whatever generation you want to call it, you're in, there's this, this need for a little bit of context of relationship when you share about Jesus. It's not just a syllogism where you share a couple points and then kind of make a response, but it's to see who Jesus really is. Because there's some wacky views about Jesus. Oftentimes, people want lie, not truth. There's this constant influence of evil. So like Paul, like Moses, like Jesus, have a heart for those who need to hear. See, in closing this morning, here's the couple takeaways I hope we have from God's word. Number one, suffering and cost is part of the dynamic of following Jesus. Unlike Herod, Let's stop trying to be the king of our little world and just worship the king. Live for him. Start looking at life through the filtration of our future and win at the right things in light of eternity. Number two, the world we live in, perhaps more modern and sanitary, but wacky views about Jesus. He's much more than a man who existed. He's the king. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. And people don't always want truth. That, that's right. If there's resistance, may there be this sense of persistence for us, not militantly, but graciously and patiently. It's the kindness of God that often leads us to repentance, not at the expense of truth, but in tandem with it. And just like Herod, easily influenced by evil and sin, so we are if it weren't for Jesus. <laughs> But let's pray for hearts like Paul and Moses and Jesus, and let's live on mission in our world where he has placed us. And that's what I mean by that. Our world, not just the globe, your world. What encompasses your world? Relationships, workplace, recreation. In your world, right where he's placed you, Live on mission with a heart for people to know Jesus and experience the forgiveness and freedom that's found in him. Happy Father's Day, the death of John the Baptist. I hope the takeaway is, man, there's this beautiful tension in following Jesus of, of authority and power and blessing and favor, and it also costs. And just as we also see the dynamics in Herod's life, may we be those that just cling to who Jesus really is, that share and show him to a lost and hurting and dying world. And may we just be persistently loving with the truth in the world that we're in.